All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. I'm very excited and I've been long awaiting this conversation with this individual because he specifically is an expert and not just an expert, but a manufacturer and producer of red light therapy and light therapy products altogether globally. So this individual is Alan Dykstra, and he is the CEO of Cayenne Medical and an expert in all things light therapy. He moved to China 10 years ago with a dream. He wanted to be the biggest producer and manufacturer of LED therapy products on a global scale. Now, a decade later, Cayenne Medical has become one of the largest and most innovative producers and manufacturers of LED therapy products worldwide. With over 10 years of experience working in the medical device industry, he is very well equipped with the knowledge, research, insight, and vision to perpetuate the benefits of light therapy to the masses. As a passionate biohacker, Alan hopes to continue, grow, innovate, and produce more high-quality products through Cayenne Medical. So without further ado, Alan, really happy to have you on the podcast. Welcome to the Red Light Report. Thank you very much, Mike, for that introduction. Very cool, very cool. Now, I've been here now for over 16 years already in China. So 16 years, core, just doing red light or light therapy, though. Arrived here with an age of 13. So with an age of 13, I arrived in China, uh, came by myself, exploring, purchasing in China and how that went. And from there on, pretty much went every couple months to China. It was a super exciting country. And here, really, the sky is the limit in making things, manufacturing and so on. And we had the passion for creating new, innovative things. First, tell us about the story. And you can integrate how you kind of got into red light therapy. But you and your business have a pretty interesting beginning. It's almost like a Steve Jobs starting in his garage before he built up Apple. You had kind of a similar experience with you and your company, Kyan Medical. So give us that that story of starting in a hotel room, essentially, right? How it's grown a decade later to be such a global presence in red light therapy. And also, yeah, tell us about how you got interested in into red light therapy. Yeah, so what it was, it was like this, that uh, pretty much when I was 18, 18, 19 years old, my family was like, okay, Ellen, you're going to go and get out of this country. And I'm from Holland. So they were like, okay, you're either going to go to the US, you study there, or you're going to go do, do your business. And you've been so many times in China, just follow your dream and do it there. And I really loved it because my, my parents are very entrepreneurial and they stimulate to, yeah, go out there and do your thing. What happened was that at the age of 18, I started and I already had the knowledge of coding. I could already make electronics. I have the soldering and basic electronic skills already and could make my own electronic equipment. At the same time, I could code my own website and already did my sales when I was 12. What it was, I went to China. I was like, okay, let's go give it a try. And I started from my hotel room, exactly, where I started to sell uh, teeth whitening lights. So that time, teeth whitening lights didn't even exist. They didn't exist in the dentist. They didn't exist uh, in the beauty salons. And slowly started to roll, roll those items out where I was the first manufacturer of teeth whitening lights in China. There was a company called Beyond and there was a company called Zoom. And uh, yeah, I was making them in China. And we were using LED lights instead of halogen. And we found out that, you know, the halogen uh, light is just as effective as the LED lights that we were using. So uh, why not just go for LEDs? You know, they last longer and definitely give up that wow effect when you turn on the blue started to make my own teeth whitening lights and uh, what I did I went to a metal shop around the corner I started to bend the metal sheets into a little box and bought magnifying lights of a manufacturer and that time there was no Alibaba yet there was Alibaba but it was not really hot yet it was uh, easy 21 what it called uh, that time started buying uh, magnifying lights removed the head of the magnifying light and started to put my teeth whitening light on it uh, super funny though, because magnifying lights, they're, they're very heavy glass, glass discs, and my LED box was just a little tiny box. 
So what happens? <laughs> people doing their teeth whitening and the arm would shoot up. So not only they had white teeth, there were no teeth anymore. <laughs> so yeah, you now we started to improve and we started to make things where I used a flexible gooseneck arm, like you see in the IKEA now, and and yeah, those type of items. Super fun, super exciting, and really all uh, yeah from my hotel room to get it right. And that was one of the experience, also one of the reasons why I went to China was I was ordering China items and I said, okay, let's get the white one or let's get the red one. And I finally end up receiving the blue one or the yellow one. So every time left or right, there was something off. And I said, okay, I can just better be there because I know what I want. A very fun experience it was. Uh, went to the factory, uh, finally end up uh, doing it myself in a metal shop and go to the car paint shop to paint the metal and then, yeah, write the program for the PCB myself and assemble the PCB myself first. So started like a little production line there already from the hotel. We slowly expand and really every year the, the business went triple to, to more than that because, yeah, light therapy, like the teeth whitening, or other devices that I start making uh, were really kicking off. You suddenly saw that every airport in the U.S. had my teeth whitening light. If I went to the U.S. Uh, on a business trip, I couldn't go to a mall and I didn't see my teeth whitening light there. You know, we, we made for 26 different professional teeth whitening companies. We started to make lights. Uh, was amazing, was was really cool to see because we go to Europe, we go to an exhibition, go to uh, yeah an airport and I see my products there. So what I achieved a level where uh, we were pretty much the top player in teeth whitening, you know, making devices like this and even the big ones, somehow I picked up uh, light therapy and doing light therapy, I honestly, I was like, wow. Who, who is going to do this? Who's going to believe this, you know? Because there was there, there were not enough studies. The studies that were there were all about lasers. And I had a customer saying, I would love to have a handheld. That person was Wesley Burwell. It was a bit of the hocus pocus where he would talk about what it does. And then at the same time, he would talk about fairies or other things. And I was like, ooh, not so sure. <laughs> so super exciting. But uh, yeah, I started to make this light uh, and it was a little handheld laser. He, he said, OK, I'll come to see you one time when you go to Europe. And he came to Europe and he saw my granddad not being able to grip well. I told him about it. I said, look, uh, Wesley, he, he had a stroke uh, two years ago. You know, my granddad is my superhero. I grow up pretty much with him. He teach me everything. He teach me the engineering, programming, everything. And then he had the stroke and he didn't know how to start up the computer anymore. You know, he had difficulty with that. And he couldn't squeeze a can of Coke. So Wesley, what he did is he took one of the devices that I made and it was a handheld. We put a few lasers in it. We put frequencies in there. He started to place it on the back of the head, started to place it on the back of the head within less than four minutes. My grandfather held a can of Coke and he squeezed it. And, and I was like, wow, wow, you know, this is my hero. You fixed him. It's like you, you see Superman getting fixed and, and, and not by his kryptonite, you know, it's like amazing. And uh, yeah, since that moment, I got hooked to light therapy and I'm just like, OK, how can I scream off the roofs to make people see that how important light therapy is for people and what it can do without any of those side effects of any pharmacy, pharmaceuticals or so on. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against pharmaceuticals, just use them or abuse them in the wrong way doesn't make any sense. Well, light therapy can do the same thing. And yeah, I, I uh, at that moment, you know, got addicted to making let, uh, yeah light therapy devices inconvenient that now you know a lot of red light comes out infrared and so on uh but honestly i'm for the whole full spectrum there that's a pretty darn powerful story um and when you see it in person or when you have a treatment used on you personally and you see that aha moment or it's like it's almost too good to be true that that like you said that's where you get hooked and that's where you just want to let everyone know how powerful this treatment is and that's how it was for me as a physical therapist. When I learned dry needling, um, I had some pain issues that I'd been dealing with for over a decade. And when I was doing this dry needling course, my partners got to my hip, just a couple needles in, and it was gone. 
that tightness and that discomfort was gone for the first time in 12 or 13 years. And so that's where I was like, why the heck isn't dry needling used more often? It's very underutilized or people don't even know about it. And so I yeah. literally started my own PT practice uh, based on my belief in the power of dry needle needling and it's thriving today. And people come from all over um, the state to see me specifically just for dry needling. And it's illegal in some states because acupuncturists think, you know, it's infringing on their state practice and all that. But like you and red light therapy, and I, I'm the same way with red light therapy. I think more and more people need to know about dry needling because I'm saving people from surgeries. I'm saving people from years and years and years of pain because they've been to Dr. A, B, and C and they haven't been any help or they think they need back surgery or they think they need all these pharmaceuticals. So like red light therapy, dry needling is non-invasive, very safe. And the benefits are massive. So when I read about red light therapy and I read about the mechanisms and how it worked and I read the research, there's so many parallels with red light therapy and the fact that it reduces inflammation, improves circulation. That's exactly what dry needling does just differently. And so that's where I got my buy-in because I knew how powerful dry needling was. And I'm like, if red light therapy does those two things, I know how powerful that is. So I need to look more into this red light therapy thing. And that's how I kind of came onto the scene. So it's really cool that you had a similar story in the sense that you saw red light therapy fix a relative, your superhero, who was dealing with a, a stroke for a couple of years, correct? And within minutes, it was improved. It was, it was just like, whoop, squeeze, everything was gone. It was amazing. Well, so my follow-up question is, after that you know, four-minute treatment or whatever, did his symptoms come back? like over oh, so, days or weeks or, or did he just do consistent treatments after that? No. So, uh, you know, he's a PhD engineer. And when I started to talk about light therapy and then plus or minus those fairies, he was a little bit like, Ellen, forget about it. You know, the I'm fine. Okay. I, I, I already gave up on this. And then after those four minutes, it was, it was just really gone. And he is able to write. He was able to use the computer again. Uh, yeah, it had a bit of damage, of course, to his brain because of those two years, you know, having the stroke. But his functions, uh, you know, squeezing the hand and all these other things. And, and his brain was, was pretty much back again. Yeah. So it was like getting my grandpa dead, uh, back again. So that was, was really amazing. And just seeing that myself made me realize that, wow, everybody needs to know this. Why is this not in everybody's house like a Band-Aid? You know, you, you, you bump your head, use the lights, you bump your head, use a pill. It's something that I would like to go and scream off the roofs and uh, show everybody the advantages of. And what's cool is that we, we do a lot of projects, right? So just this year only, we already did 72 projects. So 72 of, you know, these type of devices that you can see. They're small, big projects, you know, like the really big canopy beds or other things like that. It's getting a lot of traction right now, uh, light therapy. Once you start to see this on a relative, you know, then any person will become an advocate of red light therapy or, or just general light therapy. And that's why I predict that within the next two, three years, uh, every person will have a light therapy device in their house. I completely agree. Uh, I think the tide is turning. And like you say, as more and more people start talking about it, like you exposing it to the masses, I think it's just going to take off pretty darn quickly. With your projects, can you tell us, you know, what they're specifically on, like if it's brain or skin or hair or, or oral health? There are a lot of projects I can't really talk about, of course, because we are on the NDAs. But I, I can tell you some of the projects and I can say, definitely tell you some of the areas that we work on. A couple of years ago, Brain was was really excited uh, because that time Michael Hamblin came to us and says, oh, you know, Ellen, can you help me uh, make a brain device with this pulsated light? for my clinical study. So we made two really big units for him. And yeah, it's super exciting to see what it can do, you know, now on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and just, just mood in general, you know, excited to hook it up together with an EEG and, you know, just spike people brains up. You know, you read out where people are spiking or where they're not spiking. And then you go like, okay, we wanna go and stimulate this area or stimulate that area. And then somehow with a smart algorithm, go and, and say, uh, we can go with a little app 
and and fix this or fix that and but just by questionnaire you know so brain super exciting is one of the main things but brain and gut people talk about this also a lot how is that related yeah i think with dry needling you will see that everything is related to each other you know it's not it's not you have a back pain so i need to fix my back no you have a back pain so you need to fix the shoulder you need to fix the neck you need to fix all these things because somehow they're all related so it's the same the gut very much related to the brain what they say you know uh, what you eat is who you are type of uh, attitude here in china as well we have some really fun items teeth whitening right uh now is getting oral care Oral care in gynephitis, TMJ is super exciting because a lot of stress gets also locked up in the jaw. You, you can see if people are stressed just by pressing here or feel it just by, hey, their jaws are all locked up. That, that's one very exciting one. I love the eyes. Definitely 100% for the eyes and light. So I get so that question it, all the time. Like, is it safe for my eyes or how does it improve eye health? So... What, what is your understanding based on the research and your expertise as far as we know it's good for the eyes, but it's relatively lower dosage than, say, treating your muscles or your arm? What's your understanding? There are basic things like what they say is like an IEC 6027 something report where they, they measure based on the size of a human pupil, how much light can go in there without damaging the eye. And then damaging the eye is actually coming from a more older uh, technology where uh, you have a continuous wave of light coming into the eye and that many milliwatts will overheat the eye based off animal studies and things like that. Now everybody knows that, okay, we we don't really want to use a continuous wave. We want to use a pulse light. So uh, somehow that report is already outdated there. So you see a lot of these studies where you see safety reports, they're saying this, the actual new technology is saying that. Now it's not catching up on each other. So you live off the new technology of an old report. Now, okay, we, we need to take that. It's somehow, I, I was very excited when I saw the new clearance of using IPL light into the eyes. I was like, wow. You know, so there, there was a new clearance of using IPL. So IPL is just for everybody's uh, intensive pulse light for dry eyes. So that was like a big breakthrough. A big company, don't say their name, but a big company is using an intensive pulse light to cure dry eyes. I think that already would say a lot about the safety of usage of light on the eyes. I'm a huge fan of using light in the eyes. One of the things that, of course, you don't want to overdose. Uh, You don't want to overdo anything. The moment you start to overdo anything, you get to the point where, okay, we need to find a balance. And and that's a cool thing. I would love to talk to you about about frequency or things like that. And the thought about that, because, you know, it's balance, it's frequency, it's pulsation. Every time when I ask that question to one of the professors that I work with, either if it is Michael Hamblin, Glaber, or any of these other big professors in the light therapy, uh, they pretty much go like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why pulsated light works. Mike, what, what do you feel about uh, pulsated light, though, versus continuous? Well, just based on the research, like you're alluding to, there's there seems to be some health maladies or issues that are more readily going to accept the pulse light versus the continuous wave, like you're saying, the eyes being one of them, the brain being another organ. I mean, I, I don't know it very specifically, so I can't really say um, yay or nay. I can tell or... you why we did the pulse light for the brain firstly. Sure. One of the main reasons was uh, to get rid of the heat. Right. Like, like with the so, eye, like you were saying. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, how can you deliver an overdose of light uh, to the person without burning him, without, yeah, creating too much heat into the device itself? So limitation there is the device as well. And we found out that uh, if you do a duty cycle of 50% and then you give a pulse in a 10 hertz, you somehow not overdose on uh, heat on the device, so you're not burning the skin, so you stay within the medical FDA regulatory rules of staying below uh, 41 degrees Celsius. Does that have, specifically with the brain, is that because you need to get light through the skull, so it kind of takes a higher dosage, it takes more duration to get the certain amount of joules you need to the brain, 
but it's fighting that skull. So you're losing so much light going through the skull. So if you have a higher powered continuous wave, then you're going to deal with the heating issue, I would think. Is that what, what the uh, pulse? Yeah, but not so much heating in the brain, more heating in the device that we started to make. So when we did the okay. development of these clinical study devices, uh, we pretty much also told Hamblin, look, Hamblin, if you want to make two, 200 milliwatts or something like that, we can't do it without making this device like this big. Right. And it go like, okay, yeah, then let's just pulse it. These basics came from that. And then we see, okay, yeah, it's very effective. I do like the idea of, of the pulsation, but I, I, I have a bit of an issue with that we still don't understand why. Well, that's what I was going to say. So the pulsation, just to clarify, it's more for the health and longevity of the device versus it having a specific physiological effect on the tissue you're treating. Yeah, so it's like it's like I saw one of your podcasts where somebody explained about the 630 nanometers of red light and then why are they using that? It was pretty much because we could buy that chip. It's pretty much the same on our side. When we make the clinical devices for clinical studies, uh, we live up to the max, the doctor says, but then we get to points where we say, oh, we can't make this in this and this way. Do you want to either pulse it or do you either want to yeah, make it continuous and really big? Uh, we got to a point where we said, okay, we, we need to make it uh, post. Gotcha. That makes sense. I'm kind of stepping back a little bit as far as if you meet someone or you know someone or you have a friend, they're interested in red light therapy, but they don't know much about it or people have heard about the benefits because it seems like red light therapy has the potential to treat every darn thing under the sun. So it starts to sound like a snake oil pitch. So how do you explain to people who are wanting to learn more and understand how red light therapy works and you know, make them understand without uh, sounding like you're selling a snake oil? I don't think it's almost possible because you, you come with a lot of things like technical terms. Uh, you, you talk about ATP, mitochondria, you know, cytochrome, all these other things. But what is very interesting, but at the end of the day, these are things that they found out that they could measure and they see a difference in, right? It's not really a diagnosis. It's not really like, oh, you need this much of light to do this type of treatment. We see a movement in this uh, because of the red light. I think that people really just need to experience them themselves. At that moment when they experience it themselves or to a relative, that's the moment when they really snap like, okay, I believe in this. This is the, the new big thing that would treat or help me for uh, what they experience. I, I don't think you can really convince somebody by just telling them so. so at least you cannot convince me. I was going to ask if someone's on the fence, it's like you hear all these good things, but it's kind of an investment if you're purchasing a device. So it's like, what would you tell them to try to kind of move them in the direction of at least trying it out, at least experience it for yourself? What would you tell them to kind of guide them in that direction? Oh, there are, there are really cool purchase programs where you can buy something and then in a couple of days or 30 days, 60 days later, you can return it, right? So definitely, if you use it, you will feel an experience. You're going to have a benefit. If you use it after training, you, you, you feel like a new person. You, you know, you feel like, oh, no more aches, no more, no more those type of things. But they're very basic to your body. Um, if you use it on a long term, you feel different human. It's not something that you can convince somebody within the next day. But yeah, if you really want, then say, go to the gym, exercise as hard as possible, use the light. And, and next day they go like, wow, this is amazing. So that's an easy sales pitch, I think. Maybe the easiest one. We make things like, like this, yeah? these type of face masks, mask. and yep. so, these face masks. Funny story, though, I get later on that, uh, how we start to make these. But yeah, people uh, feel a little tintling on their face. They feel better from the lights. But honestly, they don't see a difference within the next minute. So people go like, yeah, I, I don't really believe this yet. Until you get that rhythm of really using it for 30 days, your skin starts to clear up, improve. You don't have those wrinkles anymore. You see them disappear and you go like, wow, this is really amazing. Teeth whitening, different story. It was amazing business. The issue with the business is that there's no more margin pretty much in it now. But when we did teeth whitening, you put it in your mouth, 10 minutes later, your teeth are sparkling white. Everybody could believe it in a second uh, because if you're not, then it took you 10 minutes to see it. 
Uh, light therapy, different thing, yeah. Definitely, I think, just one of those programs. I'm not sure if you're doing that, Mike. Uh, you're a 30-day money-back type of thing or so. 60-day trial wow. period. So especially days. if you're dealing with pain, like you said, you're not going to see in the first week or two light. I mean, some people do, but not likely, especially if it's chronic. It can take 30, 45, 60 days. So so we do that because, yeah, we want people to have a legitimate you know, trial of red light therapy and hopefully they see the, see the results. And certainly within 60 days, unless you're dealing with something very serious, you should notice uh, the benefits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think magic number is 30 already for most of the people. Super good. So, so I have a question, uh, especially with your expertise and knowledge. Um, what do you think are, you know, a myth or two surrounding red light therapy, you know, if any? I like to pop this question to many people, and I like to question it as much as I like to question the idea of pulsed light. Why would a 10 milliwatts be less good than 100 milliwatts, meaning that joules still being the same? So if you if you do 10 milliwatts over an hour or you do 100 milliwatts over 10 minutes or six minutes, then what do you make as an argument saying that the 10 minutes or the six minutes is better than the one hour, for example, for a person? I think it really just comes down to treatment efficiency because pe- people are on the go, go, go. They have to do a thousand things in a day. And so if they can decrease a treatment, let's say from 20 minutes to 10 minutes or uh, 30 minutes to eight minutes, they're going to be much more compliant with that particular treatment, whether it's red light therapy or anything else. So they're more likely to be consistent week in and week out and uh, accrue the benefits that they're looking for. Whereas if you have to sit around for an hour every single day, you're going to have some people that do it, but most are going to not afford them themselves the time uh, for that treatment. So I really do think it just comes down to efficiency of time leading to better compliance. It's not that a higher number is better because it's a higher number. I think it's just that uh, efficiency of treatment. It's cool to see that you acknowledge, you know, that that somehow lower power also can be effective, which you see sometimes better, right? Today. Depending on the yeah, tissue. So, so exactly. So when I did light therapy, uh, we didn't have the the twenty watt LEDs. We didn't have five watts and so on. We we had those little bulky LEDs, and they were like five milliwatt output. And I can tell you, we had people rolling in wheelchairs and walking out of the places just with five milliwatts. We treat them and and they felt like a different human. So I see it a little bit as trying to either use a sledgehammer, you know, and hit that nail or be very precisely and try to hit that nail. I think one of the biggest issue is that we are not able to diagnose the effect or the, the issue or the, the input that we need for red light therapy. So we are not able to say, okay, we can pinpoint here a little hammer and here a little hammer to fix the person's issue. Like what you do with the dry needling, you have an issue, you you pinpoint that muscle, you do it that way, you stimulate it in, in this way, and then, then you get it fixed. For red light therapy, we try to go and just use a whole bunch of needles now, just a whole big light to go and say, okay, I must have hit it. That's, I think, the really the most exciting thing about this business for me, we still don't know the business. We still don't know the way to diagnose. Uh, we still don't know the way to measure. We try to measure by testosterone increase, by ATP, but these are just effects. These are not things that you can measure. The measure is, uh, I take a measuring device and can say you have a fever. Measuring of red light therapy deficiency in your body or red light therapy needs or the absorption of your body to see what is the reflective rate of your body or what it, what your body takes out and what does it absorb? What does it need? How does it transfer that frequency into your body, into something that it needs? These type of measuring tools in the world don't exist yet. For me, um, being this many years in uh, light therapy, I can tell you that that's the big thing that I would like to change and, and make sure that we get to a point that we can diagnose, we can measure, and we can really see the, the effect of what light therapy does to people. So are you saying like a device or, or devices or tools that would be able to tell what the person's dealing with, what deficiency, 
how their body, how their biology is going to respond to red light and thus have an appropriate dosage, right? Something to that effect? Yeah. So uh, dosage, frequency, wavelength, these type of things, because, okay, red light is good for this and this and this problems, but um, it also sometimes does this issue, sometimes not. So sometimes we see it it's very effective for people's eyes. Sometimes we see it doesn't do anything. Then if you go to a bit more yellowish light, you see, wow, this does amazing results and really good clinical studies about eye repair uh, for people with diabetes as well. And then if you go to a more lower wavelength to the green, you see even, wow, now it can treat glaucoma and other things like that in clinical studies. I think that your your body needs light, right? Your body needs light as much as it needs oxygen, as much as it needs water. What is super interesting is to see, okay, how can we say that this part or this organ in your body says, I need this to be able to do that? And how can we see uh, the effect and, and the, the yeah, that it actually starts to stimulate it? You know, when we when we increase the body, we can see the temperature go up. When we, we have a fever, we, we know, okay, exactly 37 degrees and higher is not that we what, what we want. Now, how can we measure that with light therapy so that we literally can scan the body, see what is the reflective light of the light, read out what, what your body needs, and then give that light? Because I definitely love red light therapy, but I think that a lot of other spectrums can be just as useful. To circle back to like, how would you measure? What about like a wearable, like all these watches that measure your heart rate, heart rate variability, maybe uh, vascular elasticity, stuff like that. Is there a way to have a wearable, whether it's your wrist or a ring like the aura ring, or maybe even like a headband to measure these different biometrics, like you're saying, to get some relative instantaneous feedback for I'm using this for my brain and for my mood and stress. Is it actually working or do I need to switch my dosage? Uh, something like that potentially, or you think an even more robust device? We're still looking at the effects off, right? So what does it do when you shine it on your brain? Okay, you see you see a change in EEG, but you don't see what it needs. You don't you, you're not able to diagnose it uh, yet with with a certain tool. What I definitely think is that we need to look a bit more out of the scope of what we have right now. Stop thinking about uh, the tools that we use right now of yeah measuring and trying to diagnose and, and maybe even look more at what uh, Gerald Pollack, maybe you know him, uh, you mm -hmm. know, Nobel Prize winner uh, of water. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should be looking at that because uh, very cool things happens to you in your body what we are 90% water, you know, so if, if we could see things changing in the water structure uh, in that area, maybe we can see why that part of your body is active, not active, is having pain, not having pain, uh, chronic, not chronic, you know, uh, your body can repair it itself. It's, it's amazing. But sometimes we get a chronic pain because we don't, we don't listen to ourselves anymore. And that ignoring yourself, I think we can start to measure. And one of the things that I think is a huge key for that is measuring the, what Pollock has tried to measure in water. Uh, I think we can try to measure that in a, in a human's body. And, and if we can bring movement in a certain area, so just like a, like a heart rate, then we are able to repair. But but we start to ignore your arm, not by because we ignore the pain. No, we just don't use it anymore. We, we don't use that part of the body anymore. We start to compensate. So that part, we, we somehow say, okay, we, we, it becomes chronic. What is cool is that if we can see this by water structure, what I guess uh, would be one of the main ways to measure these type of things, we have a chronic issue there then we can try to make movement in it. Movement can be by a needle, can be by light, can be by PMEF, can be by RTMS, can be by all these other things. But as long as you create a movement in it, you start to loosen it up, you start to make movement, and then you start to have that repair. And then your body goes like, oh yeah, I, I, I got an issue here. Let me go and try to fix it. It's amazing when I talk to Michael Hamblin about, you know, we made a device for his spine, spine treatment, repairing people's spines, and then pretty much ask him, you know, okay, why or how does it work? And, and you know, simple things like why or how does, does frequency work? Uh, and, and still, there is a huge question. We don't know it. 
so I think we're looking in the wrong direction. I think we should be yeah, looking at different tools, different ways of measuring uh, the effect and, and what light therapy does and why it does it that more than uh, thinking around ATP or these type of things, uh, mitochondria or so on. So you think that there, there's more, um, of course there is, but you think there's like a significant portion of the effect of red light therapy or light therapy in general that has more to do with the proposed theories of reducing inflammation, improving circulation with nitric oxide release and optimizing the health of the mitochondria. Uh, you think there's a huge impact on that biological water, that fourth phase of water that's inside our body that's playing a role for a lot of health issues or or pain and whatnot? Yeah, because everything we talk about, right, like the ATP, the cytochrome, mitochondria, all these things, they're in that, they're in that fluid. We're, we're in that bag, right? So if, if there's no more movement going on in that fluid, then you get that stagnation of a certain area. We either call it a stroke or something else. You get stagnation of blood cells, right? What, one of those things is that what light therapy did uh, to my granite within two minutes, whoop, movement uh, cleared up. Wow, it started to function. Uh, you could squeeze your hand again. You know, these type of things is just very clearly you can see, okay, it's it's creating that flow again. And you, you see it also in muscle repair after you go to the gym. You see it in many areas where, uh, and, and yeah, Pollock proved it in his Nobel Prize winning study where he proved, okay, it moves water. You know, it does all these things. Uh, what so, moves water? Uh, the infrared light there okay. so yeah so it, it's it's just amazing to see that that's able to do that just imagining and, and knowing that we're 90 percent water i think the one and one and two that's pretty interesting because one of my friends tracy dues she's um she's all about water and like you're talking about fourth phase water structured water um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Quinton water uh, from, yeah. from the plankton bloom off, off of the coast of is it Spain or France. And then, of course, the newest, uh, greatest thing in water is deuterium depleted. So, I mean, she's all about optimizing, obviously, the water you consume, but the water in your body as well, like, like you're alluding to. So you want to be able to measure the, the water in our body. Do you also believe that you can structure the water, so to speak, or increase that fourth phase of water? by using a device with infrared or putting the, uh, the glass out in the sun and able to structure it, consume it, and potentially have an effect on your body that way. Yeah, because you feel that also, right? It's one of those things you instantly feel that, hey, you put the water out in the sun, you, you feel it's different. It's very different than when you drink it right out of the bottle. Uh, but I love to be really wrong, right? I'm not very close now on, oh, it's just that ATP. Uh, I've been in light therapy for so long that I see one trend go to the other trend, go to the other trend, and they all make sense. But uh, the biggest issue is still we don't have a way to diagnose or measure or or do any of these things. So what I think is that, and, and that's the biggest struggle that we have right now in all, all light therapy business is that we try to fight getting medical claims. The biggest medical claims that we have right now, and it's very poorly, is um, anti-wrinkles, uh, anti-acne, a little bit of pain relief, not even too much. Because we can't say too many things herpes we got a little bit psoriasis and we got somehow some wound healing in the u.s and a bit more wound healing in europe uh, but that's it you know we have nothing else the studies are over eight thousand studies on light therapy eight thousand yeah they can't be all about acne or just uh, wrinkles right so we see a lot of things happening with light therapy and the only problem that we have is going through that phase of proving why or how it's working. And I'm sure that if we can get to the point that we have a diagnosis device, then it's like, look, it works for eye repair. Look, it works for TMJ. Look, it works for, you. yeah, any of these things. And, and then the FDA or any of these uh, regulatory bodies, they will just tap it all off because they have nothing to argue it with. Because we say the diagnosis device does this, 
And as long as we know that the diagnosis device is uh, functioning and actually shows that it can do all these things to your body, then all the proof that we bring into the diagnosis device that, A, we can do Parkinson's, hey, we can do Alzheimer's, or we can do all these other things that is just going to be all automatically regulated just because the device can tell you that it is working for that. And now it takes a hard time to do it de novo. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with, you know, going through a medical claim. But when I did light therapy, there were no 510Ks yet. And one of the first 510Ks were these, hair grow. You know, these one of the devices that we make for people, uh, hair grow devices. It literally take people to just go and count the amount of hairs, centimeters square, six months later, go and measure it again type of thing. Uh, it's ridiculous. So I, I think once we start to be able to make a measuring way that light therapy does work, then all these medical claims will be sorted automatically. That's pretty interesting. And that totally makes sense as you continue to explain it, just to give further credence and proof and something very objective um, as a measurement diagnosis tool. So that's interesting looking at the water in the body and how that's changed. So I'm sure you've talked with this from all the different people that reach out to you, like Michael Hamblin and other professors. Does that make sense to them? And is this something that's being worked on as far as trying to measure something else or measure the body or measure water and, and see if um, there is a change when using light therapy? Uh, you know, uh, going to these points, I, I I first thought of a couple of years ago, I thought, OK, we need to go and do a spectral meter and measure what comes back, what your body reflects back again and what your body absorbs. So you can see the absorption rate and then, you know, see what your body needs somehow. Then finding out that that's not really the most efficacious way of doing this. So got really interested in Pollock studies and found out, hey, th this makes sense. This is like a new way of seeing the efficacy of, of, of light. You don't need to stay within the range of light to be able to see what it does to you. My first thoughts of using spectrometers and these type of things, I'm still thinking of using light to measure light to see what the person absorbs. But the person is actually 90% water so why not why not go and use that as a base uh so no it's very recently uh it's one of the things when uh Amblin retired uh that i actually started to work on this case and yeah we, i ping pong a lot of with uh professors about this and uh, yeah they're they're really excited about it i can say uh but definitely it's all still big questions right yeah because like you've alluded to the research is all over the place, even within like a certain treatment, they're using different wavelengths, or they're using different devices, or one's laser, one's LED. For the most part, they're positive results. But as far as like honing in on a specific dosage for a specific treatment, like hair health versus skin health, or even anti wrinkle versus acne versus cellulite, it's still the wild, wild west in the sense like, like I said, it's all over the place. And I think as time goes on, and like you're saying, there's mountains of research already out there. And that's going to continue to go parabolic, I think, the next you know decade or two, because um, there's a high interest here. So I think as time goes on, we'll get more and more specific protocols for you know different health maladies. And I also think we may even find that different spectra within red light treats different things like 660 versus 655 or 650 or 640. Same thing with near infrared or infrared specific spectra may be more efficacious for particular ailments. So I think we may um, obviously get more specific treatments, but then even within the spectra, see different benefits from different wavelengths. I don't know if you agree with that, but yeah, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. No, totally. And um, I, I, I see it like this. When we go all the way back to caveman style, we're behind glass windows, not so long. So we're, we're really made to be out there in the sun and, you know, we're, we're made to receive that full spectrum. Now we're just getting a tiny portion of it, what we think is sufficient to light up your house. And then horrible thing, we put those films, I have them on my window, uh, <laughs> to, to block out infrared because we love the air conditioning too much. And we worry that, you know, the infrared somehow warms up your house. I love to be outside and, and get a bit of that sun. But yeah, now not everybody has that luxury. 
we're all hiding behind windows in all first of all uh, the frequencies that 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 blocks uh second of all the the wavelengths that the windows blocks is just horrible it's like uh people try to say okay i have a phone and i cannot watch too long at my phone why are you sitting behind a window all that other healthy light that you should be receiving what we made of receiving uh, we are not getting. So I really love that principle of uh, caveman ID. I love the idea of, you know, seasonal eating, you know, just eat what's in the season, this type of thing. Uh, just basic, all these basic things to what we are made for. And that now we're, yeah, we're, our living environment is changing so fast, but our body is not. So we're not really made for staying behind the windows, staying around all these electricity cables, so many of these EMFs, and because we never had that. We were always grounded, right? We were standing on the ground. We, we were sleeping on the ground. Now we are totally isolated of it. I think really much go back to basics and, and look at from there. And then um, any wavelength can be useful for your body. And I don't think there is one that we should uh, exclude. Right. I totally agree with you. Like we, you said with the caveman, we've completely flipped the script. We now no longer get full spectrum sunlight, or if we do, we're slathering on chemical laden sunscreen. We're wearing sunglasses, so our eyes aren't getting the appropriate wavelengths, or we're just not outside in general. We're we're under fluorescent lit lights, so not only are we not getting the healthy light, we're inundating our bodies with with this toxic light, um, and then like the EMFs, the Wi-Fi, and all that. So it beckons a question. Do most of these diseases and chronic maladies we're seeing today, is it because we're malnourished with these spectra of light? And like you're saying, with seasonal eating, it makes total sense because you're going to be eating the freshest fruit food that was affected and grown by full spectrum sunlight. So you're going to be absorbing that light via the food. So if you're yeah. following that seasonal diet, like you're saying, that's exactly what you're doing. You're following the sun through food. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Would we even need photobiomodulation devices would we even green light orange light if we weren't so malnourished from full spectrum sunlight oh uh, i i don't think i would be in business if uh, there were no glasses in the houses so yeah it's like we're taking it away we're taking away oxygen from people but people don't know it but uh, yeah it's like we're taking away the red light efficient infrared People don't know it. And uh, yeah, now I'm in business to add it to people. But I, I don't think I've had that business if there were no windows. Right. And that's why I tell people it's like there would be there'd be no need for these red light therapy devices if we weren't so deficient in these wavelengths. But if you're deficient in red and near infrared, you're deficient in all of them because that typically means you're not seeing the sunlight. So, yeah, to your point, there would be no light therapy necessary if we're getting full spectrum sunlight maybe like the, the northern latitudes you'd still want some light therapy to negate um seasonal affective disorder because that's real that's not going away if you're living yeah. um yeah, that yeah. high up but otherwise like you're saying with skin health hair health energy levels mental health it's like if you're going outside you're grounding consistently you're getting that full spectrum sunlight in appropriate amounts where you're not burning your skin and causing issues there then you're probably going to be pretty darn healthy with a sensible diet. Oh, you're, you're going to be low. really healthy. Yeah. Yeah. So really everything that you need to do to be healthy is very cheap and free. If you talk about sunlight, um, grounding, you might have to in, quote unquote invest in healthier food, meaning organic versus fruits and vegetables that have pesticides, herbicides, that kind of stuff. But for the most part to move the needle, it's pretty cheap and or free to you know improve your health or optimize your health yeah and um i met some really super interesting people in, in my in, in my yeah last 15 years about light therapy and you, you, have you ever done it where you wake up together with the sun and you start to praise for the sun and um yeah you do that sun rising yoga that's just super exciting. And yeah, I didn't have enough time with that person. He passed away just uh, not long ago, but a genius, a genius in, in light therapy. And, and he every morning stands up before the sun rises and then he starts to go with the sun. Super exciting to see because you see how he used uh, light therapy to heal the body, but also how he used frequencies and he had a practice. He was a doctor really exciting uh so definitely go out there see the sun 
don't buy my devices. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, though. It's like, yeah, go go get it from nature before you start investing in this technology because potentially you could heal heal yourself uh, for free, so to say. And so, Alan, you're you're a pretty obviously being in red light therapy. You're a biohacker, so I'm curious. Outside of potentially, you know, red light therapy or light therapy. What does your daily life look like from a biohacker perspective? Okay, so um, I'm not sure if you know Wim Hof. Uh, yep. I love this idea. Um, wake up, first of all. I start with a habit of uh, lemon. Lemon. I love lemons in the morning. So go a little bit lemon, ginger. Start with that in the morning. Love to add the red beets uh, because we don't get those really here too much. Uh, what, what happens is uh, take a cold shower freezing shower if possible and feel good fresh for example in my house if uh, my daughter she's five and you know five-year-old jumping around hit her head you know any of these things she she really just directly walks and and takes a led pad so takes one of these type of pads or your handheld and just puts it on her it becomes like a habit now and she she got a, a sore somewhere she goes like oh i need to use the light now so and she really sees the benefit herself so it, it's something that that yeah is very normal in our house i do like to get a bit more cracking and it's one of the questions i would love to have your idea about is you know how can we get away from the device idea because these things they're, they're really device, medical device type of ideas. For some people, they, they say they're just gadgets, these type of things. But how can we make it as a part of our lives? Uh, what, what's your opinion about that? Well, that's, I think that's one of the biggest hurdles that you know anyone in the medical field, but especially something young and growing like red light therapy, um, has to overcome. And I think it's just education of the masses and ease of use so like we were talking about before the higher irradiance doesn't mean it's better than one with a lower irradiance but it will make the treatment a little quicker and i think that's a lot more attractive uh, in this day and age of people you know just on the go 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 if you can make it as easy to be compliant as possible the more likely a person's going to use it consistently to um, realize those benefits. And I think it's just one of those things that it's going to take time, but when it strikes, it's going to be parabolic, meaning when enough people see other people getting positive results, whether it's for oral health or hair health or skin or, or panels or whatever, it's just a snowball effect. More and more people will talk about it and they'll tell other people who will learn about it, use it. They'll tell other people people like you and me having these conversations, exposing it to more and more people. It's a snowball effect. So I think it's inevitably going to grow. Like you said, in the next couple of years, I agree. But I just think it's people like you and me and others just consistently talking about it and exposing it to the masses in a way that's not like pushing them to use it or again, sounding like a snake oil, like it's the end all be all. Because again, it's just one other tool that you can utilize along with your diet, sleep, cryotherapy, or otherwise. So it's, it's not the gadget to fix every single thing but it can help with quite a bit so it's it's a tool just like you said a band-aid um there's so many uses for red light therapy everyone should have one in their house of some size or another so if they get a pain or a neck or a bump or they want to decrease their stress or there's just so many uses it, it would be a shame for for people not to have this piece of technology that has so many uses and i think there's just an education hurdle and again the compliance the easier we can make it, the better we can educate people on its potential uses. And again, more specific protocols, because a lot of companies or a lot of people just say, use it 20 minutes every day, use it 30 minutes every day. Well, that's probably going to be over-treating. People aren't going to see the results that are touted by the research or other people. So they're going to say, well, this is just a gimmick. Light, light can't heal me or it didn't work for me. So I think there's just that education gap. The research is going to become more specific, some more specific protocols. And then making whichever device it is as easy to use and as efficient as possible, but still getting the results, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, uh, on my side, I, I'm more looking for the ideal, you know, uh, how can we change people's 
uh, lifestyle type of device, or, or I don't even want to add the word device anymore, because it seems like all these little devices that we make, uh, people use it when they have an issue, and then they stop using it when when they don't have that issue anymore. And I'm, I can say I'm guilty of it as well, you know, uh, many, many things. It, it should be something like in people's life where it becomes like a secondary to toothbrush, uh, brushing your teeth. Life's already so full, so we don't have time for uh, adding another 20 minutes uh, of, of doing that. So, uh, yeah, it was really seeing like, okay, how could we get people to use it while they don't feel like they're using it. And I tried to tackle this. And as I wrote now about 120 patents, I got right now on my name. One of those patents that just got cleared in the US about a year ago was a device that we made that, that projects light on you. We, we made a device where it actually goes and it tracks a person we have a face uh, recognition device in there, so you can even see if you got a little pimple here. And then what it does, it's it projects just that blue light at this spot. We went to the CES with that about three years ago in Las Vegas, and it got somehow promoted with the Dutch government that time. We got a little area there. They, they were like, wow, this is an innovative product. Prince of my, my government came even to support it. What happened was that you could really clearly see that uh, people were just not getting it. So we had this whole cool device there. People went to our booth and it scans your face, right? So that was already cool. There was like, wow, that was that CES factor because they had all these devices where, you know, it does AI stuff and it scans and so on. So they were like, wow, it scans your face, knows that you got acne, knows that you got wrinkles or psoriasis. Uh, but then the secondary part where we said, yeah, but we're actually treating it. They were like, yeah, you're telling me to go to the doctor after you scanned it? You know, so that whole part of understanding that, you know, your kid could sit there, play a PlayStation and be cleared of his acne, the awareness that that even is possible is totally not there yet. It's, it's like sometimes I feel like we have that glass bowl, right? So when I made a silicon facial mask that can shape yeah. your face, I did this uh, about 12 years ago. And at that time, there were, you know, that harder masks, harder facial masks out there already that were shaped like a face. But, you know, try to put a remote control in your face. It exactly feels like that. I'm guilty of making those remote controls as well. And that's why we went like, OK, this user experience is horrible. Let's go make something that forms to your face because nobody's face is the same. It was impossible to sell. Impossible. Mm -hmm. Everybody was like, why should I slap that pancake on my face? You know, it was form factor. Uh, we went to Procter & Gamble. They did a clinical study with it. They said, wow, amazing. Everybody clears his acne. Yeah, but they think, and then they did it with, so they did it with about 20 kids in a the room. They were making jokes with each other because they think it looks like a Halloween mask. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they uh, they preferred that time to have that, that type of blister plastic type of shape uh, mask to put on somebody's face. So Procter & Gamble said, yeah, Ellen, it's very efficacious. Uh, pricing, everything is right. But uh, yeah, people are making a joke out of it. Now, about 12 years later, we can see that our factory can't make enough of these. We, we're seeing that uh, the market is so big for this product and it's been so welcomed that uh, now we, we we seriously don't have enough people to go and produce it. That's the same with the device that we did three years ago already on the CES, where it scans people's body and recognizes that you got psoriasis, it recognizes that you got wrinkles or acne, and then projects just that light that you need, and that is FDA cleared, that you need for uh, doing the treatment. And seriously, it's impossible to sell. Uh, there was no way that I could sell that device, Mike. Which is mind-blowing. And a lot of it, it being selling products, comes down to, I think, marketing. You can have a subpar product, whatever industry it's in, but if you market the heck out of it correctly, it's going to sell like hotcakes. Whereas if you have a superior product, 
that is very efficacious, very effective, but you do little to no market, marketing or it's ineffective, then you're left with an awesome product that's not in uh, the people's hands that it needs to be. So I don't know if it comes down to that, but a combination of marketing, like you're saying, um, education and awareness to the masses, that's difficult when you have something that can help so many people, but but they just don't know about it. Yeah, so I think that right now form factor and, and the understanding of light is still in the device view. But I, I think that honestly, that will go away very fast that uh, people won't go and think, oh, let me go and use this device. I might think that, you know, light therapy might be hidden in uh, paintings like this behind me or uh, somewhere else that people get it, but they don't really obviously feel or know it. And somehow they receive that benefit. What about something as simple as light bulbs? I mean, you have to be under light when you're in your house and it's dark or whatever. So obviously the industry and the light bulb industry has gone from light bulbs that used to produce infrared, which was heat, yet expensive because they produced heat, to now we're under this fluorescent where it's white light, blue light, which is not healthy for us. So I'm sure people don't want to walk around in a house that's like uh, just all orange or yellow or green. But I mean, is there a way kind of like that? If if you're in your shower, uh, you're going to be there anyway. Why not use a certain color of a light bulb that's going to be on you for 5, 10, 15 minutes, however long you take? Or if you're using a vanity mirror or um, in your car somehow, just places you're already going to be. Yeah, I was pretty much asking you about that thought. So, okay, car, shower, mirror, you know, those type of things, you know, I think it's, it's amazing uh, to see that you share the same vision that, you know, light therapy uh, should go out of the devices somehow and more into your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And if it gets into your lifestyle, people will start using it and it becomes like a staggered type of uh, treatment. Yep. And in that way, you, you you cook, but at the same time, you're treating your own body. You're in the car at the same time, you're treating your back pain. You're taking a shower at the same time, you're doing your full body recovery. These type of things, I think, is in the next two, three years, we will see more light therapy going that way, where the devices will be a bit less. Actually, lifestyle will be a bit more. Yeah, I have no doubt. Kind of like we we're talking about, easier to integrate easier to be compliant because you're not even really thinking about about it while it's happening to you. And if there was a way to integrate this concept you you were talking about as far as being able to measure and diagnose your body, what it could potentially utilize. So if you have all these different lifestyle products, they could be emitting the light that your body needs right now based on what this measurement, whether it's water or otherwise, is saying. So you get in your car, oh, whatever, if it's a wrist or however it would measure biometrics, for, for the water, let's say, for that example, oh, your back needs this orange light right now, not red. And then you go to cook. Oh, you need some purple light or some green light right now instead. Or you're in the shower. Oh, based on your biometrics, you need some orange light. So if there's any way, it's pretty complicated, but if there's any way to integrate that, holy cow. There, there are some basic chips right now that, that don't do just to HRV, but they also can measure blood flow into yeah. your body. So you can measure uh, where you have enough blood flow or not. And yeah, that's already a good start, right? Uh, Blood flow, pain relief, these type of things is already a very good start. But yeah, I definitely think that we're we're still there to go and and still find out what's the actual way of doing it. The only issue with what I just said, I thought of this as you were talking, is that the light can't get through your clothing. So if you're in a car with a shirt or coat on, well, how's it going to get through the clothing to your back, we, let's say? We actually did, uh, we, we do a lot of measurements because we, we make a lot of textile devices. So mouth mask, light goes just straight through that. So infrared um, is only being uh, stopped for about 10% uh, on non-woven textile. So if you have a 40 milliwatts, you go down to 36. Now, that, that's pretty good, right? White cotton. Uh, we have about uh, 30% blockage. Your shirt will block a little bit more. So everything that's darker in color is blocking more also of that infrared because there's a bit more carbon in it and carbon somehow has a tend to reflect the infrared light easier. But uh, light goes pretty well for your clothes. It it just means that uh, from a five minutes, you need to make an eight minute session. Uh, So yeah. So were those measurements specifically for infrared? 
Yeah, so what I just told you is because I, I did it yesterday. Uh, oh, yesterday okay. I was cool. measuring uh, measuring on uh, masks, uh, what, what it did. I That was on infrared, that was on an 850, but we have done it on red as well. And we see that it, it doesn't go much lower. So the minimum you get is all the way down to about 40% of your original output power. Uh, What's well, not too bad. Even with red light on. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, of sense. course, blue and other light, they, they don't go really well through it, but then yeah, right. just use it long. Yeah, that was going to say because infrared, of course, is the longest wavelength that, that we're talking about. So as the wavelength gets shorter, it's going to penetrate less, just like red only really treats the skin, whereas infrared can penetrate much deeper. So the shorter wavelengths would have a tougher time getting through the clothing. So if you're doing orange or yellow or green, they would penetrate even less than red and so on and so forth. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do see it like that. But also you see that if you take a red and you take a, a different color textile, it does work differently than if you take an orange. It doesn't mean that the orange lower wavelength has less potential to go through some colors. Uh, so it's really uh, depending on uh, what's the textile made of and what's the color of it. Gotcha. Um, so super fun to see. We we have a little lab in our own factory. So we got all we got the big scope. We got the output power. We got everything that you need. Uh, we do our own waterproof testing and so on. The type of experiments that we do on a every now and then basis. And today uh, or yesterday, I was busy with uh, what does infrared do on uh, mouth masks, facial masks. Uh, was just fun to see. Definitely. If we haven't talked about it already. Um, this is kind of one of the last questions. What has you the most excited about the future of, you know, light therapy and red light therapy? I know we've kind of talked about a lot um, on the horizon, but is there anything we haven't mentioned that you're excited about? Uh, so maybe it's a bit more of a personal drive. Uh, so my personal drive is to leave a bit of a footprint behind. It sounds really big, but the direction that we go right now not just uh, 120 patents or something else, uh, but really uh, coming up with something unique where either it's a unique way of doing a diagnosis for how we measure light or the efficacy of the light on a person or uh, how we can establish new type of treatments and, and these type of things. Because a lot of people talk about dosage, but it's, it's like plus or minus, and it's it's on people's uh, results. It's not on, on actual measurements. And the real measurements, yeah, it's still not there. So I think uh, leaving a footprint about is really the big drive. And it's what's so exciting about it, because it's just in front of us, but we, we, we still don't know how to do it. It's like we know there is a vitamin C, but we still don't know how to measure it. And we know it's going to come in the next couple of years. So I would love to be one of the first. Well, sure. Sounds like you, you could be um, the past decade from where you, where you began in the hotel room, you know, working with the uh, teeth whitening gadgets to where you are today. It's, it's pretty darn impressive and you got a lot of things going for you. So it was, it was a pleasure, Alan, having you on over, you're over in China. It's over past midnight yeah. at this point. Um, whereas it's, you know, mid morning for me. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule, um, especially as late as it is to discuss it. You gave a lot of insight. I hope people uh, got a lot from this conversation, hopefully a better perspective of light therapy in general, but red light therapy too, and its potential and where there are some, you know, potential areas that need to be improved or, um, more. Uh, learned upon, you know, like Alan saying with being able to measure, that'd be huge. But then also the bright, you know, no pun intended, bright future that light therapy has and hopefully will have, um, given that there's adoption by the masses. Um, so it's, it was a really exciting conversation. And we'll definitely have to have you on in the future, especially as things progress with light therapy and research, and especially with what you're doing at, at Cayenne Medical. But, but again, Alan, really appreciate your time. Yeah, no, thanks, Mike. Cool being here. And uh, I would love to share. Uh, we, we do a lot of these clinical studies, so I would love to share the next one uh, that we do with you uh, here on the show. Yeah, definitely. Um, lastly, where can people go to learn more about you and Cayenne Medical, you know, what you're up to and, you know, what you're doing? 
Oh, yeah. So first of all, we, we support people that want to engage into clinical studies and we give them uh, devices to help with that. So uh, they can go to kayamedical.com and uh, they can read up a little bit more about what we do, what devices we make. And uh, yeah, on the website, you can find our contact details to uh, pop your new idea about the next best thing for light therapy. Gotcha. Awesome, Alan. Well, guys, Alan from Cayenne Medical, Dr. Mike Belkowski from The Red Light Report. We're signing off. Everyone have a fantastic week.